so I'm honored today to have um, Dr. Trevor Gibbs. Um, thank you for being here, Dr. Gibbs. Thanks for inviting me, Mito. Uh, I'm excited to see what you're doing, and I'm looking forward to, to talking with you a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I actually heard first heard um, heard about you on Jared Walpaw's ACRAC podcast, and I thought, wow, there's like this is awesome. First of all, you're an anesthesiologist, so you know we have you know we've common interests, and secondly. Um, I thought your story was so interesting and I wanted, and I thought the audience would love to hear how you, you know, navigated, um, developing your product and how you went about it. So I really appreciate that you're here to here today. So thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to love to kind of walk through this. And like I said, you can kind of guide me through and hopefully bring, uh, some things up that maybe we didn't touch on with Jed. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, well, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit more about you. Dr. Trevor Gibbs is a founder and president of Anistand um, Inc. Dr. Gibbs is an anesthesiologist and a partner in a private practice. In addition to these responsibilities, he works, he works, um, he does some medical device consulting. Anistand is the only anesthesia specific stand on the market and available in the US and Canada, but hopefully um, hopes to enter the market in Europe soon, as well as the Middle East and Australia. He owns both the patent and trademark for Anistan. Most recently, he started helping other inventors bring their products to life by helping them pitch their product. So I think that just scratches the surface of what you do. You know, you're, you were, when we were speaking, you said, oh, you know, I don't want it to be too long, but um, you know, that's incredible. And um, I'm really excited for you to be here. Um, so I wanted to start out with a little bit more about what made you decide to create this product and how you know you kind of went about it so why don't you tell us a little bit about that so you know just taking a step back when i first entered practice or you know was going through college and med school this was not the plan i planned you know my plan was to be a, a physician uh, i didn't take engineering or business classes in, in college and went through medical school and got out into practice and it was really necessity uh being the mother of invention uh i was doing an induction or, you know, putting a patient off to sleep and the think the supplies that I needed in a, in a rather urgent situation um, were falling on the ground. They weren't available as quickly as I wanted them. And I thought, oh, I need to buy an anesthesia stand so I can have my supplies right here. And as I went to search for it, it wasn't there. And I began to think, well, maybe, maybe I could make one and just kind of brainstormed a little bit about what I would want in one and uh, what would be helpful to me in the operating room and other places. And then I was frozen for a while because I, I didn't really know the next step. And so it was probably a year or over a year um, before I actually got to take my first steps. Yeah, that's understandable. I mean, sometimes we have so many great ideas, but we just don't know how to like follow through with them. Um, so I wanna ask you, uh, how, how did you actually start to how did you actually start to develop it? Um, you know, did you have a mentor that helped you? Did you have someone that was able to guide you through the process? I did. So finding that person, finding that first step, I would say for me was the hardest part because I didn't know about accelerators and incubators and innovation labs and all these things. I had never seen Shark Tank. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just didn't know that whole world of entrepreneurship. And so I was just doing some Google searching and I came across an organization called SCORE, which is Service Corps of Retired Executives. And there's a chapter in my area and I looked on there and I thought maybe this could help me. And on there, I saw an engineer who had had a patent, started a company and then and sold the company. I thought, well, that's somewhat close to what I want to do. Maybe I'll reach out. So I reached out to that mentor. We set up a meeting. He asked me to make a little presentation. And after I finished that, then he was able to help me make those, those first step contacts that were, were so important to, to get the ball rolling. He put me in touch with a, um, a prototyping lab. Uh, the prototyping lab had a project manager and of course engineers. Uh, he had, uh, hooked me up with a, a patent attorney. And uh, so from those first couple people that he connected me with, off we were running. And it was, it was and then Bruce, his name was, he uh, kind of, especially for that first year, uh, helped me bounce things, you know, you know, I bounce ideas off of him, what things should cost, what should be the turnaround time, um, should I continue working with person X, I don't feel like I'm, you know, a big customer, important to them, and uh, just telling me what would be usual or customary and response times, and, and, and many other questions was, was really important. I mean, finding the right person 
is it's not always easy and sometimes you have to change and sometimes you need a whole team of people and you take the best from each person, but it, it's, you know, if, and when you're doing something new, it's essential. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, did you, as a physician, you know, we don't have much knowledge about this. Um, even the business aspect of, you know, financing, raising money, um, you know, trying to pitch your product, like, did you end up finding a partner for this? Um, did you end up just doing it on your own and utilizing mentors and advisors? Um, Eventually, I took some investors who are only other anesthesia providers. Okay. Um, so, so eventually uh, I did take them, but it was just me bootstrapping it for several years. Um, and, and, uh, you know, there, I, I reached kind of a, a, an inflection point or a point where I had to make a decision, uh, you know, could I do all this work myself? And it just got to be too much. So I was either going to need to go with a larger company, a large medical device company, or bring some people in that could help me. And so when I went to these anesthesia providers, I didn't just want money, but I wanted help. So I said, you need to be an active investor. And so uh, I decided that I do want to stay independent as a company at that point, uh, but mm -hmm. I had to bring in some help for some financing, but also having a team where we could collaborate and I could delegate to, and we could get things done in a timely fashion. Yeah, that's, and also, you know, to have people that are in the field, you know, the, or the product or your field, the product that your field focuses on and is trying to help is also beneficial um, just to bounce off ideas and, you know, for every step of the process, I feel that probably it's very beneficial to you to have that understanding. Yeah, um, absolutely. yeah. And, you know, in terms of where you, the patent process, um, you know, where are you in the patent process? I know you have some, pat you have a patent developed, um, you know, how long did it take you to develop that patent? It sounds like this process has been a long time, has been taking, taking a lot longer, you know, than people would think. So why don't you tell us about that a little bit more? So my patent in the United States is fully issued. We do have a, a nice patent mm -hmm. um, with uh, several claims and independent claims, uh, something that I'm, I'm very comfortable with and have learned a lot about in the process. Uh, we are, have applied in, in Canada and we're in queue there and basically... So I've applied it, it's sitting there, and then I just have to uh, file something called a request for examination. And so in Canada, we can pretty much get our patent whenever we're ready for that. We are being evaluated in Europe. Uh, and so uh, we're with the Central European Patent Office is evaluating our uh, patent and they've responded. Now there's just kind of a back and forth where they say, this isn't allowed, this is allowed, and we rewrite some of the wording. Um, and then mm -hmm. when that is issued, then I'll select the different countries in Europe that we wish to to enact that patent. Uh, the rest of the world, you know, strategically, I made the decision that, uh, you know, trying to protect and fight intellectual property battles in, in Asia can be a little more challenging and more expensive. And so, you know, we, I decided not to do that. The process takes quite a while. Uh, in the United States, once you file for the patent, it's probably 18 months until they even look at it from when you file. And then after that, there's a, there's quite a bit of back and forth. Like I said, the reviewer will look at it. They'll mm -hmm. make objections, they'll raise objections. And then of course they'll send it to you. You have to respond back to them. And then there's some back and forth. So, um, you know, uh, I would say two to three years anyway, uh, for, for a U.S. patent considering before you even, you know, submit it, there's quite a bit of writing of the patent ahead of that. So you've got to find a person to represent you, you write the patent together, you finally submit it, you know, at least two to three years. And, and remember that my device is fairly simple, so it can be even more challenging with increased complexity. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, do you have do you have the stand with you by any chance? I do, I have one right here. Awesome. And you wanna just show, yeah, show the audience like, yeah, I, I saw it in a video. So I, I'm sure the audience would love to see, sure. see how it works and stuff like that. So it's a, a fairly simple stand. It's made of a, a tray that uh, detaches. And right now we just have one tray, but the plan is to have trays that are more customized to different needs. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And then we have a, a clamp, which is very specific to the operating room table. Around the table is a specific rail. So here there's a little rectangle part that grabs that. And mm -hmm. then if you're not putting it there, I had to come up with something that could grab anything else. So this opening is, you know, for like an IV pole or any rail, a gurney bed rail. And no matter where you go, you can have your, your works, your workspace. Mm -hmm. And actually coming up with the design for this clamp 
was a little bit challenging. When I first met with my engineers, they're like, they weren't sure how that we can do it. But when we came up with this pass by technique, I don't know if you can see the jaws here, they yeah. don't approximate, they're not lined up, they're split on the bottom. So mm -hmm. you can either grab the rail, but if you don't grab the rail, this will close all the way down and grab any size rail or pole, whether big or small. Uh, the, the support post is uh, very adjustable. So you can have it up, you can have it down, you can have it out to the side and uh, just kind of lock it in place. Mm -hmm. And then the tray is customized with a few parts. The corners will grip suction tubing or anything you need. You got something to hold your IV or A-line tubing, whatever you want to put. And then right here, we have a breathing circuit that hooks up to our um, endotracheal tubes and it can clip right in here so that uh, you have somewhere to support that, especially if you don't have a place to use a more traditional circuit stand or circuit tree. Um, and it attaches just by sliding in a relatively simple fashion. There's a plate that slides underneath here and locks in. So like I said, if you have a different tray or if this tray breaks, it's easy to remove and, and, and uh, replace it with another one. That's so cool. And it's all, I mean, it's all, um, you know, you can wipe it down and use it throughout the day. It's easy to clean. I know you yes. talked to Made with uh, like a non-porous material uh, uh, called polypropylene so that it shouldn't harbor bacteria. Uh, right now we don't recommend sterilizing it, but uh, mm -hmm. polypropylene is a sterilizable plastic. So at some point we may kind of go through the validation process for that to say, this is something you get sterilized. But right now we haven't done that and would not recommend that. I feel like that would be so useful in even other settings like cath lab, EP lab, you know, like the vascular, vascular serve for vascular surgeons. Like, you know, how many times do you see like all catheters just laid out on the patient? Right. Uh, and, you know, the Mayo stand may not be close enough. So this may allow the pa allow it to be closer to the patient. Um, there are other people that are using it, whether it's perfusionist, have bought some. We have a hand surgeon that uh, she always grabs it from anesthesia and uses it for her local cases when there's anesthesia not in there. Um, Preoperative nurses, recovery room nurses. We have, um, uh, you know, like search and rescue teams using them like in Yukon. And, uh, you know, there's, we, I think eventually that we're going to enter a lot of different markets and we have requests from a lot of interesting people that want to trial it that we've had in people that want to buy them for home. But uh, what I know and, and what I know best is the anesthesia. So right now we're focusing on that niche. And then as we get better penetration, market penetration, then we can spend time and resources to expand out. That's so cool. Um, so, you know, from the time that you developed, you, you had this idea to the time that you are now, um, how many years did that take? Uh, <laughs> first idea, it was about yeah. eight years till now. From the what? first meeting with Bruce, the mentor at SCORE, is five years. Just, okay. just almost exactly five years ago. Um, and uh, could that process have been a little faster? If I knew what I was doing, for sure. If I started over today, it would be much faster. But, um, you know, when you're new and you're not sure what step to make and every step you have to talk with four or five people to be sure that's the right person, uh, it, it just takes a while. You know, and like I said, unless you you hit a home run, find the exact right person to partner with. It takes a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, what advice do you have for someone who may have a product or an idea that they want to develop and they just don't know where to start? First step would be see what's out there. Make sure that you're not reinventing the wheel. Make sure you're not spending time and money uh, to, to develop something or try to patent something that's already out there. Or if you find that the idea is out there, Maybe there's some things you're not doing well and you could do better, but you need to know where you stand. So do a pretty good search, really comprehensive search to find out what else is out there. So that would be the very first step. And the next step that we brought up is you, you do need some help. And as I mentioned, I had no idea what that help is in the day or you know back when I started, but there's a lot of it out now. So there's going to be something in your area. And now with teleconferencing, everybody doing that you can connect with, with whatever you need far away. So looking for the term, some of the things we talked about, innovation labs or accelerators or prototyping labs or incubators, all these things will have people that you need. You can email me. I would be happy to point you in the right direction. You can bounce some ideas off of me. Uh, I help some people pitch their ideas and I work with a company that could, could get you moving in the right direction that I think is honest and fair. So, um, you know, I would be a resource, but if not, just like I said, look what's up in your area and those terms, someone will be able to point you in the right direction. Yeah, that's a great, that, that's great advice. I mean, just starting and knowing what else is out there on the market, you know, like it just requires a quick Google search, but you know, sometimes people don't think of that and 
it's uh, really important to know to know right. what's out. Um, and then I was going to say just a couple more tips. You'll have to have a little bit of thick skin. You know, yeah. when you, you don't appreciate it, but when you do something like this or what you're doing, you're putting yourself out there a little bit and people are going to have thoughts and comments and know if you succeed or know if you fail. And you're going to have to just kind of wear that. And uh, you'll feel that a little bit when you, like I said, when you put yourself out there. So be, be aware that some people will doubt your idea. Some people think it's silly. And, and you probably, you know, if it's a patentable idea, you might want, not want to tell them right away, but at some point it's going to be out there. And, and, and I can tell you that some of my ads on Facebook or, or different places, you get negative comments that it's a stupid idea or a waste of money. And, you know, you have to just, just push through that a little bit. And then finally, you know, I would expect some mistakes. You're going to, you're going to spend money on things that weren't a good use of money and you're going to have some setbacks, you know. When you're first starting out, you're nobody's priority. You know, you're not the big customer. You don't exactly know what you're doing, and so you have to be a, a you know, a little bit persistent without being a pain, and uh, that's going to take some time. So you'll have some setbacks as far as your schedule, and you're going to make some wrong turns. But uh, you're learning in the process. You're making yourself valuable as possibly a consultant. You're you're working on your product, and so even if it's a setback, it's a lesson, and uh, it's 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 not the end of the world. Those are my probably my big tips off the bat. I love that. No, I love all of your advice. I mean, I think, you know, as anesthesiologists, I think, I think we've kind of, most of us have thick skin at, after practicing for a while, you know, Sure. Um, but you know, it's something that you really do have to think about because, uh, you know, sometimes what you do may not be, someone's always going to have something to say, someone's going to have something to say about your idea. But um, if you truly believe in it, I really, I do think that, you know, it's, you got to take it with a grain of salt. You got to listen to people who may have constructive feedback to give you, um, obviously take what they have to say with, um, some heed, but people who are just haters, I mean, you know, haters going to hate, right? They, that is, that is true. And, and, you know, I think to some extent, if you, you look at the people that make the comment, they have a ten, tendency, like you say, haters are going to hate. They have a tendency to kind of make those comments and you can re, you have to reassure yourself. But, you know, if you watch some of these entrepreneurial stories, they, people get so many no's, you know, you get so many negative feedback that, that you do kind of crave that validation, you know, and feel so good when you get someone that says, this is a good idea, or I've used this product and I like it, or I enjoy your videos, or I enjoy whatever your entrepreneurial uh, venture is going to be, um, that validation does feel good. But no, it takes a little bit, a little while to get that. And you don't need everybody to like what you're doing. You don't need half the people to like what you're doing. You need to get your niche and go a mile deep in it. So maybe it's 5% of the anesthesia market that, I, that I'm gonna hit and those are gonna be good users. That's a great place to start. And so you don't need validation from everybody. And, and sometimes you need to reassure yourself about that. It's, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds to just say, take things with a grain of salt when you're working on this all the time, so wanting to be successful, whatever, like whatever you're doing, um, you know, it, 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 it feels good to get some good advice and when you're not, know that you're not alone. And that's sometimes where a mentor helps someone who's been through it and not just your wife, Pat, or husband, patting you on the back and saying, it'll be okay. But someone who's been through it and says, look, we're going to make it because you only need this much of the market. That's a great point too. I mean, that even applies to, you know, social media at times. I think, um, you know, like <clears throat> a lot of some of, sometimes some of the work I do, I find, you know, I may not get traction on the things that I'm really passionate about, but uh, and that kind of disappoints me. And I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do it anymore. Meanwhile, you know, a post about a picture of me about or a picture of me and my daughter will get more traction than the actual work that I'm doing. But you know, you have to I realize I may not be for everybody, you know, and um, I know I'm helping like, I know I'm helping a small percentage of people. Um, you know, I may not, my content may not interest everybody on social media, and that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. But it's definitely, if you're passionate about it, you got to just keep trying and keep moving forward. Yeah, you're going to learn something and you're going to help somebody. Just not everyone is, is as much as you may want, but, but there, there is a value to some people that you're doing and, and value to yourself. Even if it's not your best post, your best video, your best product, you learn something. And then when you go to do it again, or you go to do it for someone else, uh, you're going to be better and you're, and you're going to be able to tell them you know, some good advice that you learned along the way. And so every step forward has some value. Yeah, I agree. Um, so 
Trevor, I wanted to ask you where you are in the process now. Um, you know, I, I know that you've developed the patent. Um, I know that we're still in a pandemic, so it's, I'm sure it's been a little challenging for you to get into hospitals and things like that and have meetings, in-person meetings, but where are you now um, in the process of uh, getting your product to market? We have had, uh, since I talked with Jed in February, we've done, had a lot of progress. We've really moved in the right direction. So our product is registered with the FDA. It's, you know, insured with, with product liability insurance, all the things you need, it's available. Our distributors and sales reps have samples. Um, and so we have coverage for the entire United States. Anybody that wants a trial gets it. And we have had a lot of trials. Uh, we've, we've probably had 90 trials already. 40 of them are still going on. Many of them have ordered. Some of them have finished their trial and are in the process of going through the value analysis committee. Um, so we are in the process of increasing or expanding our, our penetration here in the United States uh, and Canada. Uh, that's, that's the first thing we're uh, really working on. We're, and then we're going to try and get in front of people in different ways. So there are some in-person conferences. We're going to be at the ASA this year. We have a table okay. there. I, we're looking into getting a table at uh, the PGA in New York. So uh, that would be another one. Um, I'm speaking. Yeah, you should. It'd be nice to catch up over there if you come to New York. That would be awesome. And, you know, we thought about that, the ASA is in San Diego and PGA is in New York. So hopefully we could, you know, meet up with some, uh, you know, different group of anesthesia providers. And then, you know, we're going to want to be at the anesthesia residence conferences this year. We were going to be at the ASAT, which is the anesthesia tech conference, but that's mm -hmm. virtual. So we'll be at it, have a table there uh, next year. So going from just, you know, Facebook and social media posts to now having a more professional, larger presence uh, and getting in front of people that, um, that we weren't previously. We're in the ASA monitor now, so advertising and some print. So mm -hmm. we are getting in front of people in different ways and more professional ways now that we're getting a bit of traction. We're going to increase in the next year our international coverage. So we are firmly in Canada. It's probably our best market as far as market penetration. They seem to really like it there. Um, we are uh, entering the Middle East. We have our first distributor for Kuwait that we're just going through the regulatory things to get out there. Uh, we have a dealer in Australia that's working with, with us, but uh, Europe, Asia, you know, all those things in South America uh, will be in 2022 entering those markets. So it's just the regulatory hurdles and distribution channels that we're working on. Um, and uh, the uh, last thing that uh, we're working on is um, a line of anesthesia products. So we're working with Sunset Healthcare Solutions. They're helping us with endotracheal tube circuits, LMAs, all of those things. They'll be uh, uh, in a stand line of, of uh, products in the next year as well. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, lots, lots to be excited about. Yeah. Going through that pandemic was really tough when we first launched, um, but uh, we were able to poke our head out. Not that we're fully out the other side, but things are more back to normal. And uh, now we feel like we're, we're really moving in the right direction. That's great. Um, I mean, if anything, has the pandemic taught you anything um, while doing this? You know, what was your greatest lesson during these past few months? You know, I don't know about less. Well, for our product specifically, you know, we released with our first generation. Uh, and in some ways it was, uh, it was beneficial because we basically got a large scale evaluation of the product but not as large as it would have been if it wasn't the pandemic. So we made some changes to our product. We upgraded it during that time. So the lesson to us was our product needed to be a little bit better. And so uh, that lesson, you know, you can really only get by getting it out there, you know? And so this was a way for us to have kind of a limited release. You know, I read somewhere that said, um, if you don't look back at your first version of your product and you're a little bit embarrassed, you waited too long to get it to market. So the lesson to me is, you know, your first iteration, if it's not perfect, that's okay. There's, you know, Gen 2, 3, 4 of the iPhone and computers and cars and everything else. And your product is no different, especially if it's novel. If it's never been out there, you know how it works for you. And then I, you know, I could ask you, could you try it? But there's only a couple opinions. I don't know how the workflow is in so many different hospitals, whether it's teaching or team model or MD only practices or internationally. You know, how, I don't even know how the workflow is there. And so you just got to get it out there. And then, you know, you got to have to, you're going to have to come up with another iteration. And uh, that's something that I learned during the pandemic. And if I had gotten a first impression with the subpar product and there wasn't the pandemic, it might've been insurmountable because people would have said, this isn't good enough. 
and then so many people had the first impression that, that it sunk us. Yeah, that's great points. Um, so Trevor, why don't you tell the audience where they can find you? I want to really thank you for being here. Um, you know, I know that you do advise um, doctors who are interested in bringing a product to market. Um, so why don't you tell them where, tell the audience where we can find you. So if anyone has anything, any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn, just looking up Trevor Gibbs. You can email me, Trevor Gibbs at AnnieStan.com. If you go to mm -hmm. the Annie Stan website, A-N-E-S-T-A-N-D.com, and even just email the info at AnnieStan.com, that'll get to me and, and I'll be able to respond. Either you're interested in a product or even, like I said, just a question. You know, I'm not, the people I'm helping pitch, they're not hiring me or paying me to do that. It's just, hey, here's some thoughts. Here's some connections I think I can help you with. Here's this company that I think does great work and uh, I can get you in front of them and, and we can kind of see what we can do for you. So uh, uh, don't sit on your idea forever. Uh, you know, go ahead and, 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 you know, you always wonder what would happen if, uh, if, if you did, if you moved the ball down you know, the field a little bit. So give, you know, reach out and, and uh, we'll help you out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's great advice. And um, I, I'm really, I'm sure my audience will really enjoy listening to you today. So thank you for being here. No problem. It was, it was, this is a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of people that don't know how to take the first step. And so anytime I can talk with someone that maybe get the word out there and we can help, you know, healthcare providers, especially, uh, you know, use their innovation because they have inspiration all day, right? All day they, you know, they run into problems and how many times do you hear someone say, you know what we need is this. And then they move on because they don't know how to do it. And uh, if we can help people uh, take that first step, that innovation is going to help a lot of people and it's going to be enjoyable for the person that was inspired.